So far we have looked at representations of molecules using the dash and wedge representation. Meaning if you have a chiral center and if you want to represent the groups on the uh, on this particular carbon for example, you have these two groups in the plane of the paper, then the red group is coming towards you and the green group is uh, going away from you. And in other words, you could have represented them using these dashes and wedges like these. So, if you have a wedge meaning the group is coming towards you, if you have a dash that means that group is going away from you. But when you have multiple stereo centers in the molecule what happens is drawing these dash and wedge structures become a little tedious. So, in order to draw molecules that have more than one stereo center what we use is a representation called as the Fisher projection. So, we are going to look at what Fisher projection is. Okay, so, this is dash and wedge and we are going to convert this to a Fisher projection. So, for example, if a dash and wedge structure looks like this to you wherein you are looking at it from this point, a Fisher projection for the same molecule can be drawn when you look at the molecule like this. Okay, so, I am changing your viewpoint from here. Now, I am going to change it such that you start visualizing the molecule like this. Okay. So, this same representation now becomes such that horizontally two groups are coming towards you and vertically two groups are going away. Okay. So, what you have here is horizontally for example, horizontally the red and the green one are coming towards you and vertically the white and the blue one are coming towards me that is really going away from you. So, if I want to draw these Fisher projections properly, okay, what we have is somewhat like this, but really when we project it you just draw a cross like this, a cross wherein the horizontal groups are coming towards you, the vertical groups are going away. You can always remember that Fisher projection kind of looks like a bow tie that is the person is wearing a bow tie. So, that is how I remember that the horizontal groups are always coming towards me. Okay, So, this is how that person is wearing a bow tie. Uh, so, now let us place a particular molecule and draw a particular molecule uh, in which we are representing it using a Fisher projection. So, I am going to draw this one here. Okay. So, now let us look at how to assign the R and S to the Fisher centers. So, remember all the rules are the same except for one rule. When you draw a Fisher projection you want to it is typically drawn such that the carbon backbone is vertical. So, in this case the all the four carbons in the molecule are represented vertically that is the only one new rule that you have to remember when you are assigning Fisher projections. Other than that all the other rules are exactly the same. So, we go ahead and rank all the substituents on the carbon such that the higher atomic number gets the higher priority and so on. So, in this case you do have first priority going to this oxygen. The second priority now between this C double bond OH group and this one really big group here, you can imagine that the top carbon is attached to two oxygens or rather it is really double bonded to an oxygen. So, that gets the second priority and this bottom carbon here gets the third priority. So, now if I really look at it what I see is that it is moving such that it looks like S. Okay. But remember in Fisher projection the horizontal lines are coming towards you. So, even though it looks like S this one is really R. Okay. So, the first one is R. What about the bottom one? I will apply the same rules. Now, this is 1. Now, if you think about the top group that is this one and the bottom methyl the top carbon is attached to a, an oxygen whereas, the bottom methyl is attached to all three hydrogens. So, do you have a second priority to the top carbon and methyl gets the third priority. Now, this also looks like S, but remember the least priority group that is hydrogen is coming towards you. 
So, again it looks like S, but it is actually R. Okay, so, that is how we assign the Fisher projections um, stereo centers as R and S. So, these type of projections are very useful to write molecules with multiple stereo centers, especially molecules like carbohydrates or other biomolecules. You will see that Fisher projections provide a great and a quick way to represent the molecule on the paper. Remember that in biomolecules for example, you have really numerous stereo centers. So, we are going to see some of the examples now and you will realize why Fisher projections become so popular. So, before we go ahead and look at molecules with multiple stereo centers, I want you to recognize that as we go on increasing the number of stereo centers in a molecule, the number of possible stereo isomers also increase. So, I want to write that down that as the number of stereo centers increase, the number of stereo isomers also increase. Right? And this is not really difficult to imagine, but I want you to ponder over by how much. Just want to revise what stereo isomers are. So, stereo isomers are the molecules which are equivalent to each other in their molecular formula, in their structural formula, but it just differs in the way the substituents are represented in the 3D space. So, they, it differs in the arrangement of the uh, molecule in the 3D space, right? So, now let us look at one of the molecules. So, we just looked at a molecule in which there were two stereo centers and remember that molecule can have the two stereo centers as RR, RS, SR or SS, right. So, there are four possibilities for a molecule with two stereo centers. Uh, let us now go on increasing the number of stereo centers. The typical rule to give out the number of stereo isomers is that if it is the, the number of possible stereo isomers for any molecule is 2 raise to n where n is the number of stereo centers. So, now let us look at a possible stereo isomer. For example, um, let us take glucose. So, the open chain form of glucose has around 4 stereo centers, right? And these 4 stereo centers, meaning the possible stereo isomers of glucose in an open form, is 2 raised to 4, that is 16. Let us just move on to sucrose. Now, sucrose here has 9 stereo centers, being a bigger sugar. This sucrose is the same sugar that you have uh, in your kitchen. Sucrose, for example, has 9 stereo centers. So, you can imagine that the number of stereo isomers for sucrose goes 2 raised to 9, that is 512 different types of sucrose if you want to make, different stereo isomers of sucrose if you want to make, you can really make them. Okay, so, as you can imagine, having more and more number of stereo centers in a molecule really increases the complexity of the molecule because now you can create those many stereo isomers of the same molecule. So, now let us look at one of the examples, but I want to point out that we are talking about the number of maximum possible stereo isomers. So, 2 raised to 9 is the number of maximum possible stereo isomers of sucrose and we will look at some examples where the number falls a little short than the maximum possible number and we will look at why these formula calls for maximum possible number. So, now let us look at one of the molecules that has two stereo centers. So, I am going to draw a molecule here. Okay. Now, let us assign the R and S to the stereo centers here. I have oxygen as the first priority, this is the second, this is the third. So, this moves like S, but remember the least priority group is coming towards you. So, this is R not S. 
the same way for the bottom carbon I have 1, 2, 3 moves like S but the hydrogen is coming towards you. So, this is R indeed. So, I have one stereo isomer wherein the two stereo centers are R and R. Now, let us draw its mirror image. Right. So, if I draw its mirror image, what do you have? You have 1, 2, 3, it moves like R, but the hydrogen is coming towards you. So, it is S, the bottom one is also S. So, I have an, an, a molecule RR and I have a one molecule that is S and S. Now, if you really look at these two molecules, they are non superimposable mirror images. So, in fact, they are enantiomers, right. So, they are non superimposable mirror images, they are enantiomers of each other. But now, let us keep one of the stereo centers the same and change the other. So, I am going to keep the top stereo center the same, I'm going to write it in a different ink, I'm going to keep the top stereo center the same as the first one, and I am going to change this other one. Right. Remember the top is the same, so this one is still R. If you look at the bottom one, the bottom one is now very similar to this one here, so this is S. Right. If I take its mirror image, what do I find? Right. So, if we take that mirror image, what do we find is that we have a another set of stereoisomers. Now, this is not the same molecule as before because now we have changed one of the stereo centers, right. So, if I look at the first one, this is R s and its mirror image is going to be S r. So, what we see here is that we have four stereoisomers, we have R r, S s, R s and S r. These are the four stereoisomers we have. If I ask you what is the relationship between R s and S r, they are also enantiomers of each other, because they are non superimposable mirror images of each other. But now, if the question is asked, what is the relationship between R r and R s? Okay, so now, we are talking about R r and R s. Okay, so, these two are enantiomers, these two are enantiomers. Let me just redraw it here. So, we have R r, we have S s we have R s and we have S r and we have said that these two are enantiomers of each other, these two are enantiomers of each other. Okay. So, now let us continue. So, now if I ask you what is the relationship between R r and R s or R r and S r, remember one of the stereo center is the same, but the other one is changed, right. So, it is no, no longer a mirror image. Also, they are not superimposable. So, really the relationship between R r and R s is they are non superimposable non mirror images, right. So, they are non superimposable non mirror images. And thus they are diastereomers of each other. So, this is a new term. We have learnt a new term which was enantiomers in the last one. Now, this one is diastereomers which is non superimposable non mirror images. So, in this case for example, you have R r and S r as diastereomers, you have S s and R s as diastereomers, R r and R s is a diastereomer and S s and S r are a pair of diastereomers. So, if you really see for a molecule that has two stereo centers, you have two pairs of enantiomers and you have four pairs of diastereomers present. Now, we are going to look at one more example. So, this is the example of tartaric acid. Okay. So, I am going to draw a molecule of tartaric acid. Now, tartaric acid uh, you must have heard this name before. It was really isolated from grapes 
but it is one of the main ingredients of the tartar sauce. So, what we are going to do is we are going to draw the molecule that is present as tartaric acid. Okay. So, this is the molecule. Okay. So, now let us assign the stereocenters of tartaric acid. You have 1, 2, 3. This moves like S, but the hydrogen is coming towards you. So, this is R and then you have 1, 2, 3. This moves like S, but the hydrogen is coming towards you. So, this is R. So, this is an R, R uh, molecule of the tartaric acid. I am going to call it the molecule A. Okay. I am going to draw a mirror image of the same. Now, if I want to write down the stereo centers, these are going to be S and S. Let us call it the molecule B. Okay. Okay. So, we have two pairs of enantiomers of tartaric acid. Right, A and B are enantiomers of each other. Right. Now, I am going to do uh, the same thing. I am going to keep one of the stereo centers the same, but I am going to change the other. Okay. So, I am going to keep the top one the same. So, this is still R. I am going to change the bottom such that this becomes like this. So, this is now S okay. and if I draw its mirror image, this is going to be like this. Let us call these molecules as C and D. Now, I want you to look at the molecule C and D very carefully. If you really see there is a plane that goes through the molecule such that you can really flip this molecule on the top of itself, right? such that all the groups will match. So, for example, if I have a plane that goes through here and if I try to kind of fold the molecule on that edge, then the OH and OH will match with each other, the hydrogen and hydrogen will match with each other and the COH and COH will match with, with each other. So, what you really have in this molecule is its plane of symmetry. So, there exists a plane of symmetry in this molecule. Same goes for D. So, C and D really are mirror images of each other, but they are superimposable mirror image of each other because they have plane of symmetry. So, in fact, you can imagine that I can take D completely and kind of flip it over on C and all the groups will coincide with each other. So, what you have here is that C and D are superimposable mirror images. Okay. So, as a result of which what you can see is that in fact they are the same molecule, they are not two different molecules, but they are really just one particular molecule. So, in fact for tartaric acid you have possibility of 2 raised to 2 that is total of 4 stereoisomers. But that is the maximum possible. In reality, tartaric acid only gives you three. One of them is RR, the other one is SS, and the other, the next one is the meso compound. Okay, so this is a new terminology. So what is a meso compound? Okay, so in this case, for example, the stereoisomer C and D are called as a meso compound. A meso compound contains two or more chiral centers, but really is a chiral in nature. Okay. So, meso compound are achiral in nature. Remember, because they have a plane of symmetry. So, so, we had said that having an asymmetry was really essential for chirality to exist. right? So, since there is a plane of symmetry, meso compounds are achiral. So, if I subject a meso compound to a polarimeter, for example, what is going to happen is that you will not see the rotation of plane polarized light in either direction because you have few molecules moving the light towards one direction, the other ones will move it back. So, in the sense overall the total rotation of plane polarized light will be 0. Okay. So, what are meso compounds? They are achiral, they do have 
some chiral centers though. So, they do exist, they do have stereocenters. So, they are achiral molecules having stereocenters. and they also have a plane of symmetry right. So, as we just saw the meso compound of tartaric acid has a plane of symmetry in it ok. So, when we have to figure out if a molecule has a meso compound or not we first need to figure out if it has a plane of symmetry and in fact we are going to look at some of the examples in the tutorials wherein there could be a case where the molecule has stereocenters but it is achiral because there is lack of asymmetry ok. Now, I just want to go back and revise that tartaric acid for example, here does have two enantiomers. So, if I just take pure A, it is going to rotate the plane of plane polarized light, pure B will do the same thing. But if I have C or D, which is really just the same molecule, C and D are not going to rotate the plane polarized light ok. Now, if I take an equal mixture of A and B, which is a 50 50 mixture, which is called also called as a racemic mixture. Now, racemic mixture is a, is a mixture of two enantiomers in equal ratio. What is going to happen is that a racemic mixture is also not going to show you any rotation of plane polarized light. That is because you have two molecules present which are trying to rotate the light in two different two opposite directions. And as a result the null uh, movement is 0 ok. Uh, a and B for example, here are chiral, but C and D are achiral. So, that is something to also ponder over. So, we have looked at the properties of enantiomers and we have said that enantiomers have identical physical and chemical properties in achiral environments. So, meaning that um, if I just dissolve uh, a pair of enantiomers into various solvents water, methanol, ethanol, DMSO, DMF, any of these solvents what is going to happen is that uh, they are going to probably behave the same way right. Meaning all the physical and the chemical properties are going to be exactly identical. Just to show you that what I have done is I have gotten the properties of RR tartaric acid and SS tartaric acid here. If you really see the melting point is exactly the same 171 to 174, uh, the density is the same, the solubility is the same, density is same up to the 4 decimal point right. Um, solubility is the same, the pK which really talks about the chemical property, it is a chemical property. So, uh, pK is also the same except the rotation of plane polarized light. So, if I look at the specific rotation, the specific rotation is minus 12.7 for the SS uh, stereoisomer and it is plus 12.7 for the RR stereoisomer right. So, you have two enantiomers giving you two separate specific rotations here. Now, if I really want to compare the properties of a diastereomer as compared to the enantiomer. So, I have also gotten the meso tartaric acid here and now let us look at that. Now, if you really compare the properties are not vastly different, but they are definitely different from that of the enantiomer. So, for example, uh, meso tartaric acid has the melting point of about 146 to 148. So, there is about a 20 degrees difference between the melting points of these compounds. You also have it having lesser density that is at 1.66, the solubility is different, the pK is different and the other pK, the second pK is also different. So, what it shows is that diastereomers have different properties than enantiomers. So, if you really see here the RR tartaric acid or the SS tartaric acid is a diastereomer to the meso tartaric acid. So, what really uh, what we are observing is that enantiomers have the same chemical and physical properties, but when I look at a pair of diastereomers they differ in their uh, chemical as well as physical properties ok. So, now what we are going to do is we are going to see the use of this property uh, being used in order to resolve enantiomers ok. Thank you.